I'm Suzanne Murdoch and welcome to Series 3 of Powering Productivity. Each episode I explore the energy, the really genuine connections, expertise and being in your best flexible working environment can bring to you, your business and your whole life. So let's get started. Welcome to you. Now, I'm back after a couple of months in juggle and reactive mode after the kids' school holidays. So what better time to talk about embracing possibilities, habits, routines, and not just planning, but I guess really being in that best mindset to take action, execute. So we are talking the 12-week year. And to help me with this, I'm joined with Bernie Mitchell who is a seasoned expert who's been around on the co-working scene for as long as I can remember co-working being around. He's a massive advocate for this and writer, podcaster and coach and a huge champion for us smaller micro uh, operators and really helps engage and build those communities with operators. So Bernie, with this in mind, I'd love to chat around some of the challenges, I guess, that um, the micro regional flex operators often face and possible solutions that we can explore collectively. And then let's talk around some of the magic that the smaller um, spaces also bring and the, the rich tapestries, including communities, engagement, connection, and how they might differ depending on location, size and culture as well. So, Bernie. For those who haven't met you or listened to you before, give us a quick rundown of who you are and what you do. Oh, um, I'm I'm all those things you said. I struggle. I'm, I'm always struggling what to put my LinkedIn bio, and for the first time in years, I, I've put what you said like writer, creator, coach, and the something podcaster, and and then I just say I talk a lot about. I mean, it's not even I talk. I enjoy talking with people about co-working and community building and the creator economy. And I use those three things is because ever since I sort of walked into a co-working space in 2010, the people, I, f- I first heard the word creator economy on a website called Copy Blogger in 2010. And the idea of people kind of owning their own jobs, being independent economic agents and everyone I've ever worked with, whether it's when I used to run networking groups in London and all the meetup groups I run, um, it's always been in some form of collaboration with people. And it's been people making videos, making podcasts, making, you know, doing writing, you know, creating something. And now, and now creator is like the uh, term du jour. And to get really nuanced here, I think I really, not even I think, I, I believe there is a difference between a freelancer if you listen carefully, the, the the freelancer conversation and the creator conversation are very different things. One is like freelancer, which I've done a lot of, is owning a job. And creator is like making your own living from your, you know, what you create. Um, so that that's where I am. And I do, and just to wrap that up, I, I wildly believe in the um, unity of co-working spaces or neighborhood workspaces or whatever we want to call them. And that create your economy person. That's where I'd like to see it all going. And I've got I've got evidence to prove it is Susan. Interesting. So actually just rolling that back a bit, do you see the word creator, the role of the creator, the new as the new innovator? I I don't sorry, I just don't like that word innovator. No, no, it, that's why I'm asking, because yeah. I feel the same way. Oh, good. I thought I thought I was going to have an awkward conversation. Your... No, not when, yet. Maybe later. Not yet. When, when, when? I mean, a good something. Something that's worth pointing out is when you type anything about co-working into um, a, an AI app, it says fostering innovative, commun- collaborative, community innovations or something like that. And it's it's a word that there's a word that just doesn't mean anything. If you if people find a guy called Liam Black who um is he he was i first met him when he was the chairman of jamie oliver's 15 restaurant and he's done loads in like social enterprise and everything like this and he wrote this scathing blog post in 2015 about people who use the word innovation and innovative and if you are making the iphone glass you're innovating if you're opening you know a a co-working space with a you know nespresso coffee machine and there's some copyright is in it that is not innovation but you like to think it is so you're kind of accidentally mis-selling what your space is um 
And, and, and arguably, anyone that turns up there thinking they're going to be dis dismantling uh, Tesla is kind of <laughs> naive anyway. So I guess let's move on to, I mean, you do a lot of work with different um, operators. Are they mainly in the micro, you don't like using the word independent co-working spaces, I know, more the micro, the smaller, often regional, rural operators. Is that is that? Yeah, that everyone... Right? Everyone I've worked with really well is outside, um, outside a big city, and they they're like they're like you and Patrick. They did something and then sort of either intentionally or accidentally opened a co working space. And I, as I've thought about this, because I keep on getting pressed on, you know, what's your niche, Bernie? It is it is people who do something then open a co working space because it solves their own problem. And then they and then they end up in this like whirlwind, which I think is what a lot of micro and small business owners they they have a family, they're trying to juggle the school run for being responsible for their business, and they're not sure whether to get a second or third employee. And then while it might seem like really logical from the outside, it's like such a quantum leap. And it's not to do with the cost, it's to do with like the headspace and you know, how to fit it all in, the whirlwind that comes with the life choice of being a business owner. Completely. And I get that. I know mean, people are often on their own. I mean, the, these micro spaces might not even have anyone helping them. They might outsource certain bits, but, you know, in the actual spaces, it's them and no one else other than obviously the communities. And I think along with that is the whole headspace thing, given that the, um, the whole industry is evolving so quickly as a small business owner, there is so much to get done and so much to get your head around. And it's a question of, okay, what's more important? What do we prioritize here? How do we keep changing, but making sure that we're still following our strategy and getting our shit done, basically, mm -hmm. the most important mm -hmm. bits. And that's what it's about, getting shit done. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you can say that. I just find that difficult. Anyway, so yeah, yeah. So how do you how do you get the important stuff done when you've got everything else being thrown at you and a lot of net 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 going on in your head? I, I, that's a, I, I'm terrified. That's a question. I the I really struggle. Um, and in you know we mentioned the twelve week year where that came about is I heard um, Pamela Wilson who was part of the copy blogger family talking about launching a book in 12 weeks and she did i mean i love this kind of thing she she got a got a, a fellow author she recorded a podcast over 12 weeks and he coached her live in the podcast and in the facebook group and then she published this book um which i can't remember that you know i've, I've met her and had dinner with her and spent a lot of time but i can't remember the name of her book but so so i saw that happen and listening to that process and she's a really skilled copywriter and marketer and then like she had issues trying to get it all done, got in her own way, you know, had self-inflicted friction and fear and, you know, oh my God, I don't think I can do this. And and he he coached her and then she asked lots of questions in the Facebook group and then she launched his book in 12 weeks. And of course, because she documented the process, had a podcast that did really well and had thousands of people in a, in a, in a Facebook group. And she did, you know, she was very open, like this is part of how we're going to launch the book. She wasn't trying to, you know, do a bait is it a bait and switch or you know so and i was like oh my god that just took 12 weeks how easy and it obviously wasn't easy and then in um at work hubs which was in houston which is a co-working space that phil dodson ran and i used to help him run we started a thing called not so manic monday which was for freelancers using the 12 week book and it kind of went Half the group loved it and half the group kind of turned up because they, with respect, they needed saving and they weren't committed to themselves, let alone other people. And at that point, I, and then Phil and I said, this isn't working. And we used to try lots of groups and if they didn't work, we, we'd can it and some would last for years. Um, and then Karen said, oh, you know, I'm really disappointed that we're not going to do that, but would you like to have a call? And we still follow the process. So for, since August 2018, I've been having a call at 9.30 every Monday morning to say what I'm going to do, what got in my way, and what I did. And that has been amazing. So you follow the process 
so to speak, every day in the terms you've got your goal, you've got your, say, your three actions, but then you've got the accountability aspect of that, that you would meet someone, say, once a week. Yeah, and that and that is the, because you hear this all the time in self-development, oh, you know, make yourself accountable, yeah, be accountable, and it feels like if you practice if you if you do some account it's like if you walk past the gym you will get fit but the the accountability is more of a i don't know brain drill than you want it and i karen's a bit more grown up than me but i thought oh right you know i'm gonna like have six startups and four four flying saucers at the end of this process and what i've learned is um and I, i mean one of the easiest things is examples to use is you know, getting fit, you you eat less and you exercise. And then when you have to turn up to someone and they say, how many times did you go running last week? And I went two. And once I ran for half an hour and then the second it was raining. So I did 10 minutes. So when you have to explain that to someone, you don't even have to, they don't even have to tell you that that's why it's not working because you've said it out loud and it's not a shaming process. It's a realizing that you're not as committed to yourself as you thought you were and over over, since 2018 this has gone up and down and up and down and sometimes it's all going really well and sometimes and that's the other thing i've learned is the it's not like uh always going up curve it's always up and down yeah and i guess when you're looking at that whole 12 week year thing the whole concept it makes sense in co-working because the industry as i said has evolved so quickly that how can you possibly plan unless you're a big corporate branded um, operator how can you plan a whole year ahead because things are so constantly changing and you're getting different things flung at you so breaking it down into those 12 weeks is a lot more realistic I guess and sustainable well what one of the things I think if you're a big corporation like you have to you know sign leases and you have staff contracts and everything like that but you you kind of have to plan because you you move slower but you know, one of the things it's not just in the the twelve week year book. You know, they people I've met along the way who follow it, um, who work with bigger organisations say like, if you you have to have a vision so everyone knows where you're going. But you know, planning in twelve weeks chunks like if if you work for Samsung and then Apple release something at the end of March, you're going to have to rethink what you're going to do in September. Um, and they argue, you know. I've never worked in a huge, you know, apart from when I worked in hospitality and worked for, you know, big catering companies, I've never been in a huge organization, but um, they just, they just move slower, but there's an, there's an advantage of doing things in 12 weeks because you act like a smaller organization. And the advantage for people who are smaller is you can, if you have three really important things in your head for 12 weeks and then everything else rolls over to the next 12 weeks, by the time you get to the next 12 weeks, at least half of those things aren't important anymore. Mm. So you, you end up, you end up doing, say you have, I mean, they recommend you have three goals at a time. So if you, if you do, can't do the maths, 12 big moves in your business over a year, you'll be in a much better position than trying to do 12 big moves from January to February which, you know, I find myself fighting with all the time. Okay. And what I find myself fighting with, especially after this whole juggle reactive thing through the summer holidays, is being in the right mindset to give this type of strategy a go. Can you can you give me any help around mindset, energy, can the whole consistency side of things? What what I found like and this happened this morning is I, I woke up later i got a really busy day and i went down to the the cafe in the market and started writing and i just i i had i knew what i was going to do already i just kind of forgot on what i was going to do so my head was in this uh, thing and like sometimes i've spent all day planning which is a complete waste of time but like acting with intent and then I, I was like, oh, I could go and check LinkedIn today. But it's like, open the open the twelve week year, open seven hundred and fifty words, and like start writing about that. And and within like fifteen minutes, I'd gone from like complete drama queen having a, a meltdown, and you know I hate everybody too. Oh, that's what I've got to do today. And it just it just became much simpler. And 
this this is something Kofi teaches a lot on Urban MBA. Like the mindset bit is so so important and you know paying attention to that when people turn up to the urban mba course which is amazingly 12 weeks long they all think they're going to build the next you know whatever super gadget or app in the first week and you spend something like seven weeks working on mindset and everyone's a bit confused until they get to week seven and they go oh i get it now and then all the action and you know producing stuff happens in the in the last few weeks and i do think it's you know, it's just it's about being committed to yourself and and that and then like spending time with therapists and coaches and peer groups and talking things over. And you know, when you work in a micro or small business and there's one or two of you, you kind of sort of end up walking through quicksand because you don't ask other people. You know, that's why that's why I'm always ranting on um online about getting together in small groups and helping each other because there's a lot of I, there's a lot of isolation which then leads to a lot of loneliness which then means to a bad mindset and i know that from ups and downs from my own personal experience yeah and i think that whole that whole um topic is how we can help each other collectively you know there's a lot of different operators um creatives that align really well together and can help each other out there from, I guess, the accountability perspective as well and reframing certain situations to make you look look at it from a different perspective and help fill that energy cup. Um, but I think in this industry, there are, there are so many fantastic, energetic people out there that can lift you up and support you. That's one of the reasons I love love working in this industry. But that's, I know, when, everyone's, when everyone says, oh, like, what's co-working? And that's just, it's all the, I've got so many really good friends, you know, either like a kind of part, I know it sounds a bit, oh, you know, they've been part of my creative journey, like talking, talking about how to make podcasts, how to write, how to, you know, what app to use. Um, and particularly in the last five years, even just before COVID, you know, I mean, that, that impacted it a lot, but you know, around the 2017 mark, so many people just started talking about um, wellness and depression and well-being. And it, it just, I, I don't know where I would have found those conversations if I wasn't in a co-working space with other f freelancers and small businesses and agencies and stuff like that. Yeah, me too. And I posted something yesterday, I don't know if you had a chance to read it, about community and, and growing our spaces and well, even online communities and how here, when I moved over to, from London to Newry, how I knew nobody and we had tiny children, you know, they were getting bigger. You hadn't been a parent before. You were in a strange, lonely place. And when we set the space up, it was very much about, you know, we we're all learning on the job, so to speak, but we were learning together. And it was, everyone was each other's sounding board and support network. And it was really organic. And without that, I don't actually know where I'd be today if i'd be in the same place doing the same thing so on on that post i've linked to a place called dinamo 10 which is i love saying this nowadays it's across the border here in portugal and joanne has been running that for 10 years she's an architect and her and her partner opened a co-working space and they it took them year and they're in this little town called i always say it wrong viana de castello and there's now there's three co-working spaces there and they basically had to like to, you know every time they met someone and i imagine this what it was what it was like for you and patrick it's a space it's not an office no no it's not i mean you can come and work here but it, and you can do this too and it is a bit exhausting but then people come in and they bump into each other and they, they've helped um now they run all these like entrepreneurial workshops where everybody in the area comes there and they have like this kind of you know I want to say network, like talk, lunch and learn stuff. And people who are not necessarily part of the space come and connect and they they find each other and finding each other in, if it wasn't for that co-working space would have been really, really hard. Um, it would have been dependent on them happening to be in the same Facebook group or something like that. So all that bringing, you know, th th this is why I think um, having having a co-working space where it's, something you do already in, in something you do alongside what you're already doing so you're solving your own prob own problem 
your urge is more than if you and i'm not condemning people that set up businesses here but you know if you if, if people have multi-site things then they're running a co-working business whereas if you are a you know something like what you and patrick do you're you've got this higher urge to bring people together yeah that whole collective thing yeah community building which i guess brings me to my next point in terms of communities bernie how do you see um the nuances between communities in different locations different sizes maybe in a rural location as opposed to more of a, a city centered location i think a lot about this you know there's there's moving from london to vigo has confirmed a lot of what i hope to be true and like in in london there's i know 800 million co-working spaces now whatever it is and in vigo there's 15 and there's the the architects go to this one and the graphic designers go to this one and the the translators go to this one and it's not i mean i'm sort of exaggerating for effect there whereas in london i felt like everyone was everyone was competing for everyone and the connections between because just because of the nature of the city the the connections between places were or the need the need was to get customers in the building whereas here it's the need to get customers in the building and connect the local community and like our the co-working space fento that i go to the most is by our son's school and everyone everything is slower and everything is much more connected and in places like Dinamo 10, they are, you know, and this is the thing I really love. And, you know, brands like Patch are going in and Town Square are going in this direction too. They are places that set out to be a local hub for the community where people can also do their work is is really, really important. And I think that's that's the difference. Yeah. Actually, Town Square, they've just opened up in um, Kingston, haven't they? They did. Yeah which is where I used to hang out. And I can see that much more as a as a community field compared to say where they are where they are across London. Yeah. So so that that Kingston thing, it's under the John Lewis and it's a new development and everything. But you know, there's like minded people will gather there. There's a place similar in Barking run by Karen called 360 Workplace. And instead of people, you know, like instead of people coming from Barking and Kingston into cool co-working space in old street um which is what you know which is what i did for years they can go to their local area and, and meet like-minded people and then those creative hubs will start to evolve there you can't just flick a switch and it happens you have to put a lot of energy into making you know, educating that community and audience there and i think i think those communities are a lot more about outside of work than just work itself and it's about how they feed into the local communities themselves and the local economies and bring they're bringing obviously they're bringing spending power but they're bringing in skills jobs there's all sorts of things culture different cultures diversity it's, it's, it's really important and the thing i always like to shout out at this juncture is like in the affordable workspace program and the economic inclusion program in islington they um it was when a pound, I'm sure this is not the only place to come up with this stat, when a pound is spent with a local business, it goes around four times. And when it's spent in a, you know, branded corporation, and there's nothing wrong with that because those people, those supermarkets and clothes shops are, are probably employing local people anyway, but the pound goes into the big company and goes off there. But if someone, you know, spends a pound in your place, it will go around... I always want to say Newbury, Newry, Newry, Newry four times. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think actually it's worth, we have to keep checking in with ourselves and reminding ourselves what we're bringing, the impact we're bringing for the local community as well, you know, as as, off, as op operators when we're often feeling that burnout, the overwhelm, beating ourselves up because we don't think we're doing enough. Actually, we're having a huge impact on not just one life, but, it's almost like a domino effect. It it, it definitely is. Mm. And another question I'd like to talk about or topic is that of coaching for co-working. And I know you do a lot of that, especially 
trying to build the communities and the engagement uh, connection side of things. Can you touch a bit on how you think that helps operators in the in the micro SME side of things? I think it it's not it's not just a. I'm sure you this is what you mean is it's not just a co working thing. It's like the any time every time I'm working with a coach or some outside you know agent or I'm in a a mastermind group I I massively get out of my own way and things I, I wanted to kind of show this in the London co-working assembly so we get more people talking to each other all the time um and the last I can't remember, I don't think you were there but the, the last time we we at Kofi's in Urban MBA. We had a round, big round table, and we got Stuart from the factory said, "This is my, this is the biggest problem in launching my thing." And everyone around the table split into groups of three. He he stated his issue. They split into groups of three. They all talked to each other, and then they came back. And I think there were six groups, and they all came back with a you know solution or idea. And they were only they had to ask him questions and then talk and then and then come back with ideas. So he walked away with this. He, he must have saved. I mean, I don't want to big up our own event to solving saving his life, but he's anyone who's opened any type of business on their own where they've put all their money into the business and they're like, oh my God, I hope someone comes. He saved like a week of, you know, thinking googling and finding stuff and then went to put those things into action even down to the event he was running next week people said why don't you do this why didn't you do this have you thought of doing this and really simple things that you know he's a really smart guy so it's not because he's stupid but he just hadn't thought of doing a follow-up newsletter to everyone that came in the building and he didn't know that the software he used could capture everyone and they came in the building and that's how we could email them I said, oh, I didn't know I did that. Because where are you going to, how are you going to have time to go and read a software menu when you've got like a hundred people coming to spend a week in your shiny new thing? So having people speed up your thinking, there's always like more intelligence with a group of people than there is like one person on their own. And that, that weekly check-in accountability, um, you know, oh, I'm going to speak to my coach on Wednesday, I'll talk about it then instead of it occupying my head here. And there's there's that ask you know, when people ask you questions, you realize you either realize how much you're not doing or how much you are doing. And either is like really good information. Yeah. And you you work a lot with Emily Breeder. Yes. And she she's was... my business she's my business partner. We were like, we've been doing stuff on and off. For 15 years after meeting in a LinkedIn group. And the only time I have to get this in, the only time we've ever met in person is we went to we went to a conference in San Francisco where there was just there was no more than 200 people in the room. And one of those people was Seth Godin. And we bumped into Seth Godin walking down the street. And and I went, Hello, Seth. And he goes, Oh, Bernie. And I was like, Oh my God, Seth Godin's oh, recognized you've me. Made it. I could I podcasted with him the week before, which is why he knew who I was, but I couldn't speak. I was like a, you know, dog with a wasp on my tongue walking down the street. And Emily was like, so, and he just said to her, so do you do a lot of writing? And she's like, yes. And they had this like lovely conversation about writing and, and I couldn't speak, you know? <laughs> oh, that's great. But no, I was going to say you work a lot with Emily and we were just talking there um, before this about how often you'd have a lot in your head. And she's trying to drill down, right, right, Bernie, where are we? You know, you've got, you're holding all this information in your head because you know how to do certain things, but you're not necessarily writing down and getting the processes strategized. Tell me a little bit more about, about that conversation and how she could help with that. So we've, she took, what's called scrum is a when people talk a lot about agile and the agile manifesto was written in a ski hut in 1999 by a group of like consultancy software people and it was and really agile is just moving very quickly you know changing direction taking assessment changing direction and moving on 
and and ever and nowadays a lot of big companies call it agile which is secret code for downsizing um and in 2015 she took her scrum master certificate because we, we were always obsessed with this and we and then when we started working together again last year we just immediately you know went in with this scrum methodology so we have a stand-up meeting every day it's like what you did what you're going to do and we just move really fast because stuff comes on the plate comes off the plate and one of the things that was really holding us back was um how long it took me to make a podcast is because despite her telling me not telling me like requesting that i write down the process i i'm, I'm not very good at writing things down um even though i know it's a really good idea and i would recommend anyone i'm, I'm working with and it went from like an hour and a half to posting a podcast to like 15 minutes because I have everything set up in a flow on my um, computer and I know what I'm going to do. So I don't have to hold the information in my head. I open the the Kanban card, which is like Trello or whatever you use, and just tick it off. And for particularly someone like me, where my brain is in, even in this conversation is like 15, you know, trying to keep this sentence on track is really hard for me. Um, I just like follow the boxes and even following the boxes is hard, but now it's become a habit. It's taken, I don't know, probably like two months to go, oh yeah, it would be a really good idea to open that card and follow the process. And the amount of time I save and the amount of, you know, we, we, we publish two podcasts a week and then sometimes chuck in another one just for fun. But it's, and it's, everyone goes, how do you do so much is because we're very interested in what we're talking to people about. So we don't have to think about what we're talking about. And then we're just very, very organized in the Kanban board and Google drive and all the apps we use. I'll, I'll put some of this in the show notes as well. All these apps you're talking about and people. So there's always an app. There's many apps that you use. Many apps, many books, many podcasts, many people. Don't get me started on the app conversation. No, no, no. We must move on. Tell me quickly um, about your London co-working assembly collective and and the next event coming up. So that, that started in 2015 because there was a Facebook group that got... There was Hector, myself, and someone called Rebecca. And we used to... We always liked getting people together. And at that time, Hector... Um, from this week in co-working in Sinkaroo lived in London and we like getting people together and it all got a bit out of control in the Facebook group because anyone that had ever heard the word co-working joined so then in 2018 we started to meet in we, we got a few things together and then it all fell apart and it was it was just tricky it was like herding cats so then we closed the Facebook group and then put the word out and then started meeting every month in a different co-working space. And at that point, people would bring loads of food. And basically, like a load of co-working space owners would get together, go to the supermarket beforehand, do a bring and share and sit around a table and like make breakfast together. And that worked really well. And then more people came and then more people came. And then for a while, we went through this, um, which we will still do. But we did this kind of like panel you know, come and hear about the future of real estate panel and, and the audience changed a bit. And then we started making it so that everyone would get together and talk to each other because the, like a lot of what we said in this podcast is people talking to each other that are on the same journey is so valuable and we don't need to manage those conversations. If, if, if I've seen it so many times, three people are chatting in a corner and they didn't realize what newsletter thing, what software to buy, you know, what door system, how to handle this member that, you know, keeps playing heavy metal music at lunchtime um, and all these things that you don't know, you wouldn't Google it, but when you're talking to people, it comes up. Um, and then our next event is on the 17th in London. And what we started to do, which is we will do for the foreseeable future because it's really good fun. We go to one place in the morning and this time we have John Alexander, who you came to yeah, okay, Peck and Lever, didn't you? So he's John Alexander is the author of Citizens, and he is going to come and run this like Q and A interactive session about membership. And it's about you know in this thing, it's like membership of a community, membership of a co working space, membership of a local area. You know how it, how all that fits together. And 
we know we're going to have a great conversation, but it's not like we're going to say to people, you know, here's our agenda for today. So it's whatever comes out the room and we know how to get stuff out of the room. It's people talking to each other. Um, and then we're going to move from that venue in Clark and well, walk across the bridge to another venue. And the folks from 360 are going to run a similar kind of workshop on how to design a co-working space, but particularly around inclusion and neurodiversity because we hear this neurodiversity word and everyone's like oh god that's like millions of pounds but it's just that there's much more simple steps and the value for people like that is you'll be in a room with other space owners with a state-of-the-art design firm and have this you, you you'll find out things you didn't even know you needed to know about designing a co-working space or you were afraid to ring up a designer in case they you know sent you a a large invoice for an hour long chat about yeah. acoustics in your space. And you're also hearing firsthand experiences and stories as to what you need to think about and things people have gone through. Yeah. So you, you, you know, you know, this thing, this thing's real and people have gone through it and what you're going to hopefully implement, you know, that's going to work and benefit that, people. That happens. That happens all the time. Like someone, when people are talking to each other, they'll go, I know they'll say something like my website crashed. I'm such an idiot. And everyone else goes, yeah, mine does that all the time. But then I did this and it's like three minutes. And, and it is, I was going to say life-changing there. It is life-changing because if you can fix your website by moving host and that's a massive problem off your plate as a micro business owner. Mm -hmm. Bernie, we're out of time. Thank you as ever. Looking forward to the next event. Um, and you ping me all the the apps and people blah 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 please please and we'll put all those in the show notes thank you great stuff see you soon thanks for listening you can find more information in the show notes or on our website thehubnury.com while you're there why not join our mailing list so we can keep you in the know about everything we're up to and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen so you don't miss an episode Powering Productivity is presented by me, Suzanne Murdoch. It's produced by Emily Crosby Media.